Welcome, everybody. This is great. I did an identically titled talk with different slides 18 months ago, and there were like 10 people in the room. So this is fantastic that you all turned up today. So uh, we're going to talk to you today about when the going gets tough, get tough going. And we'll find out more about what that acronym is as we go along. My name is David Lawrence. My name is Ashwini. And we're both security engineers at Docker. So today, we're going to talk about sort of where are we coming from with signing? Like, let's have a little look back at what signing used to be, uh, where we are with the state of digital signing, uh, some specific challenges in software distribution. Because a lot of what we talk about in terms of signing things has added requirements and properties that we want to achieve when we talk about distributing software. We're then going to look at how Tuff solves these problems, and Notary, which is an implementation of Tuff, or the update framework, uh, and then, assuming we have time, we'll have a very, very brief demo at the end. So, looking back. So, passing message around, messages around securely is really not a modern day problem. It has existed for a long time. In the old days, um, the way to pass like news or messages was that the kings of the kingdoms would uh, take a message, write it down on paper, seal it, and give it to a messenger. And the messenger would then get on a horse or a carriage or whatever was the norm at the time and pass it around to the right recipient. Now there are two assumptions that were made here. The first one was that we implicitly trusted the messenger to do the right thing and not mess with the message. The second one is that the seal that I mentioned that the kings put on the messages were very special. So the king's seal was sort of like a mark of the king or the empire and uh, uh, a good protection around making sure that the integrity of the messages remained constant was that you would just imprison or punish or whatever the criminal proceedings were at the time, uh, the, the people who tried to copy the seal. And it's, it's, it's actually a very real problem. It was then and it still is now. How do you tell if a stamp is real or a stolen one or a lost one that some random person found? So moving on though, uh, we translated the concept of seals to signatures in the modern world. And we evolved to this idea of asking people to sign documents, associating someone's signature as a mark of their identification. But this also is not a perfect solution, because what if I sign your name? How can we tell if it was, in fact, your signature and you yourself signed it? And that sort of brought about the, the need for witnesses. And a witness is basically a second person who could witness you signing a document, thereby sort of establishing that you made your mark and um, the integrity of the signature is valid. But wait, how do you trust the integrity of a witness? Witnesses can be bought, and a witness could just be a friend that you ask to say something in court. So that established a need for notaries. A notary public is basically a person that we've entrusted to be a witness, and we implicitly just trust them to be uh, good at being a witness and doing the right thing. I'll hand it over to David to tell us what happened when we all started using computers. So in between you know, notary publics and people just signing documents, we actually had these really interesting machines up on the top left. Uh, that's an auto pen, famously used by presidents, and it's literally a device for forging signatures. So you, know, you want the president to sign some legislation, if you can get access to his auto pen, you can get whatever you want passed. Um, but signing in the digital world really came into its own and really didn't exist before we developed asymmetric crypto. So just a quick show of hands, who really you know, has a good handle on asymmetric crypto? Okay, that's good. That's probably about half the room. Um, so the idea with asymmetric cryptography, for those that aren't so familiar, you generate a key that is actually a pair of data points. Uh, one of these you make public and one of these you keep private and secure as best as you possibly can. Any operation done with one of those keys can be reversed with the other key. So you want to encrypt something to somebody, you take their public key, you encrypt the data, you send it to them, they can use their private key to decrypt it. Signing, in a very simple sense, uses the private key to actually encrypt the information 
and then you send out both the plain text and the encrypted format, and a person can use your public key to do the decryption operation, match the two pieces of data, and confirm that you then actually had possession of the private part of the key. And the most well-known uh, signing, or I should say asymmetric crypto implementation is probably GPG, uh, GNU Privacy Guard. And this gives us a number of very desirable properties. Uh, confidentiality, as we said, we can use these keys to encrypt things. But in the world of signing, <laughs> encryption isn't specifically what we're interested in. That may be a requirement for a specific use case, but we're not going to address that explicitly. More importantly, though, we get integrity. We can check that a message hasn't been tampered with by using GPG signing. Through the web of trust, we also get some degree of authenticity. Now, the idea of the web of trust is that you meet people, you verify their identity, and you use your private key to sign their keys. And in doing so, somebody can then determine that there is a trusted relationship between you and that person, at least as far as identity is concerned. So, you know, the more people that have verified your identity by signing your keys, the more likely that that identity is legitimate to a random person who looks up your key in a directory online. Of course, this is transitive. So if I have no connection with somebody who sends me a message, but maybe Ash Winnie does, I have to decide if I trust that person based both on my relationship with Ash Winnie and also maybe asking Ash Winnie, hey, you know, how well do you know this person? Should I actually trust them? So, you know, auth authenticity isn't perfect here, um, but we do have some mechanism for getting trust between two parties who don't necessarily know each other directly in the real world. And then we also have non-repudiation, which in classical signing is a highly desirable property. This means that somebody can't come later and say, no, 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 no that wasn't me. I didn't sign that thing. Of course, as we mentioned with losing seals, you can also lose your GPG keys. And the lost, pro the lost stamp or the lost key problem is a real issue because you know, I may not be able to repudiate the signature itself, but I can say like, no, no, I lost my key. Like whatever was sent to you then, it wasn't me. Somebody else had my key. And the main problem with this is revocation. Revocation around keys in general is frequently based on blacklists. Blacklists are bad, they're straight up bad. Like, there may be cases where you have to use one, but you should always prefer a whitelist. The reason for this is because blacklists are fail open. If you fail to get an update to the blacklist, or something doesn't go into the blacklist in the first place, you continue to trust something you should not be trusting anymore. So let's continue looking at some of the uh, interesting lifecycle properties in software that go beyond just classical signing. Software is very, very special and has some very interesting properties. For example, um, software gets old. If I sign an email, it'll still have the same meaning years later, but software needs constant updates. Because as, as software ages, we usually find vulnerabilities. And vulnerabilities require fixes, which these fixes are then usually released as a new version. And as people download the new version and update their installations, we have to deal with incompatibility issues. And the thing about complex software systems is that trying to update one component might lead to you getting a chain of dependencies that subsequently require updating. So this brings us to interesting distribution properties. Because once you've worked on updating your software, releasing it and pushing those updates to consumers is in itself a big complex task. And as a user, downloading and updating software components securely is not very straightforward. So for example, even if I'm downloading an update over TLS and I've secured the handshake works and everything is great, it doesn't protect me from compromised servers. And servers get compromised all the time. So uh, do you all see the picture on the right side? That's Fargo stagecoaches where the TLS of the Wild West. They protected money and transport, but there was nothing from stopping an evil bank manager from putting fake money on the, uh, on the coach. And similarly, if the server or the server owner is in a location where they can be compelled to send you bad data, can you still trust the source? 
So moreover, this doesn't give us any protection from expired mirrors. If I am trying to download an update from a, a node that thinks it has the latest version but is really out of date, the, the update that I will get will appear to be a latest update, but it won't really be. And in that case, unless I actually go back and manually check the versions and do all the matches, there will be no way for me to tell that by default. So what do we do? It sounds like going is getting tougher and tougher. So as the title of the talk said, let's get tough going. And tough is the update framework uh, developed by Justin Kapos, who is somewhere in the room here. Uh, excellent work. And his team at NYU uh, Tandon School of Engineering. I'll get the name right. Um, the update framework is a holistic solution to securing the distribution of your software updates and really any digital content over the internet. So, you know, what is it at its core? And strap in, because this is where we get into like the nitty gritty stuff. Traditionally, we would sign individual packages. If you look at something like the Python package index, they still do this. Every single publisher of a package is expected to sign that package themselves. This creates an enormous headache for consumers. If I have 100 dependencies that I'm managing from the Python package index, if I'm fortunate, they will all be signed. In reality, only about 5% of the packages in there are actually signed. But assuming they all are signed, I have to go and find every single public key of every single publisher, and there is no standard way for them to get those to me, so that I can install those onto my CI systems or my production servers to verify every single piece of content I'm going to go and download. Now, some people have already improved on this by having the actual repository manager sign the packages, sometimes as an additional signature, and sometimes, like with uh, Apple, Apple, Apple iOS applications, Apple just replaces the signature but you're still typically signing individual packages. So going beyond this again, what Tuff does, and what some of the more forward-thinking um, packaging managers have done, is starting to sign the entire collection. And you know, we mentioned blacklists earlier. If I had a bad package in this world, I might have to blacklist a key or blacklist a package. When I sign the collection, I now have a whitelist. Only packages that should be in that collection actually do get signed in. Now what Tuff does that's really useful is I sometimes still want to get the signature from the publisher. So in Tuff, I can define what are called delegations, which allow me to segment out part of the namespace within this repository and say, you know what? I have a different person that I want to be responsible for this little group of packages here. And adding to this whitelist, I'm actually going to take that person's key and sign it in. And now, as a consumer, you're no longer going and getting a random key off the internet even though you don't know the person that manages this subset of packages, you can generally assume that there's probably a reasonably trusted relationship between the person that owns the repository and the person that's publishing the packages. Like, it may just be an online account, but that's more than you just going to a random website based on somebody's name and finding a public key. Additionally, because I have a whitelist, I can remove things. Like, I'm no longer tied to you know, out-of-date servers possibly continuing to serve bad metadata. I can start taking things out of my whitelist as they get updated or deprecated, or whatever the situation happens to be. And it's guaranteed that these updates will make it out to people because Tuff implements expiry times on every single piece of metadata. So I can guarantee that I will get my updated whitelist with packages removed, packages updated, delegations and new signing keys added within a specific period of time. Now, how do we actually manage all of this? Well, Tuff has four core roles that it's necessary to understand. The root role, which is responsible for anchoring all of your trust, and we'll see how that gets bootstrapped in a few slides. Your targets key, which is responsible for signing packages into the repository, and is also the head of all of your delegations. Your snapshot, which is used to sign an inventory of the other content in the repository, and your timestamping key, which is used to produce a very small piece of metadata on a very frequent cadence that just tells people, has there been any update you should be going to get? Now, these four keys are taken and put into a file that we call the root.json. 
And all of these roles here have JSON files associated with them that take their, their namesake keys. The root.json is itself signed self-referentially with the root key. This starts to give us a hierarchy. We trust this root key because we're going we're to bootstrap this root.json in some manner. And from the root key and that signed root.json, I have transitive trust on my target snapshot and timestamping keys. My delegation keys all chain as a tree that can be arbitrarily nested underneath my targets key. So I may say that you know, I have a delegation key in a role, Ash Winnie has a delegation key in a role, Jane Doe has a delegation key in a role. We may be restricted into only signing certain packages within the broader repository, and we can also further delegate. This tree can go any level down. Now that I have this hierarchy, we can use this to also treat our keys as a whitelist. If I need to change one of these keys, I can just change it at that point in the tree, sign in a new record with the parent key that I'm chaining that trust off, and eventually this goes all the way back up to my root key. So root keys are interesting because obviously I don't have any implicit chaining of trust down onto my root key. So how would I go about changing that? Well, Tuff defines how to do this. I take my existing root file that I've already got bootstrapped. I generate a new root file. I generate a new key to replace the old one. I then sign my new root file with both my old key and my new key. And this gives me a chain of trust from the data I know to the data I'm trying to acquire. The keys here have different security profiles. So as you might guess, the, the frequency with which you need to use the key dictates sort of where you're going to have to store it. If you need to use a key more frequently, you need it in a more accessible place. And the, the tough keys scale reasonably well in this regard. Your timestamping key is probably held online somewhere likely in a server that doesn't get any direct access from the, the broader internet, um, but it's, it's gonna need to be timestamping you know, automatically on a regular basis. Uh, so this has the weakest security properties. At the other end of the scale, your root key, you should need very infrequently. You typically only need this to re-sign your root.json root file when it's about to expire, or when one of your other keys has been compromised. So you can store this somewhere like a bank vault and ideally put it onto signing hardware, something like a YubiKey, to bring it online when you actually need to do signing operations with it. Furthermore, if you want to add additional protection on top of this, Tuff supports a really cool idea of thresholding. For any of the roles in my system, I don't have to trust simply one key. I can define a set of keys and then have some subset of them be required to actually create a valid piece of data. So imagine you were worried about our situation earlier where maybe the owner of the repository can be compelled to publish bad data. I could maybe generate 10 keys for signing a given role, distribute them to 10 different countries around the world, and require, say, four of them have to sign to make any piece of data valid. This makes it very difficult for somebody to be compelled, or even if one person doesn't implement good security practices, the compromise of their individual key is not enough to publish bad updates. So for people who need high security environments, this is an incredibly powerful feature. Now we talked about how we get the initial bootstrapping of trust. And much like how you'd get your CA certificates, there's like a single download point that you just, you trust that one point in time, you download it over TLS. Whenever you download something that's going to use the update framework, and this is purely an example here, as far as I know, Canonical is not using Tough. Um, when you go and download your Ubuntu ISO, you would get an initial root.json file as part of that download. And every subsequent update you do to your Tuff repository, you've bootstrapped with this initial root.json that you downloaded. So let's have a look at what that actual update flow looks like. From my pinned root.json, I'm going to go and download my timestamp file. And I don't have any other information about my timestamp file other than it should be small. So I limit how much data I'm gonna download there. I verify that it's signed with my timestamping key that I have from my root.json. Now my timestamp file contains a checksum of my snapshot. Remember my snapshot is my inventory of everything else that's in the repository. 
So for my timestamp, I go and download my snapshot and verify the checksum to make sure I have integrity. I then also verify the signature of the snapshot based on my uh, root.json file. From my snapshot, first I'm going to make sure that my root.json is up to date because my snapshot will tell me if there has been an update to the root.json. If there has been, I'm going to go and download the updated root.json, run through that key rotation check that I had to see if any keys have changed, and then replace my existing pinned root.json with the new one and start this update flow again. So when I eventually get back to my snapshot file again, I then look up the checksum of my targets file, go and download it, verify the integrity based on the checksum, and verify the signature of my targets file. And then using that key hierarchy we had, my targets file is going to tell me which delegations I have and which keys are associated with those delegations, while my snapshot is going to give me all of the checksums of the delegation files. And I'll use those pieces of information to go and basically download all of the delegations, verify their checksums, and verify their signatures until I've downloaded the entire tree of my uh, Tuff repository. So what does all of this work give us in terms of improvements in our software distribution pipeline? So yeah, let's take a look at what improvements Tuff actually brings into the picture. So first of all, whitelisting. One of the best things about the Tuff model is that everything is based on whitelist. We are inherently only trusting valid things, and all the invalid things are omitted by, de by design by default. And not just updates to your packages, but also updates to the keys that you use to facilitate those updates. And this leads us to improved key management. As seen earlier, Tuff provides a robust model for rotating and managing keys without the consumers manually having to configure or set up anything. And the updates are pushed to the users in a timely manner as soon as they're published. And this is pretty awesome. These, timeline, these timeliness guarantees solve the expired mirror problem that I mentioned earlier, where the, the server that you were asking for updates from didn't really know what the latest version was and was giving you the answer that it thought was right, but it wasn't really right. All the mirrors and servers can be expected to have the latest updates for the consumers. So now that we've talked about what Tuff is and how it works, you might be thinking, how can I use it? So it is true that the update framework needs a lot of work from the spec to signing to get to the state where you can just sign things. But here's the good news. We've done all the hard work for you. Uh, the, the, the screen you see is uh, basically Notary, a uh, Golang implementation that uh, we at Docker built. And it was recently accepted as a CNCF project. It's open source, and it is ready for use. Um, let me quickly uh, go through the architecture of Notary uh, to get an idea of how it all comes together. So Notary has a client library for integration with your use case, as well as a CLI. Now, this CLI or client ta uh, talks to a Notary server which deals with storing and serving the signed metadata. And it validates an update when it is published to make sure it doesn't break anything. The signer does timestamping. And timestamping involves signing uh, keys. And those keys are encrypted and stored in a database. And uh, well, that's a lot of like, high-level overview. Let's actually see this in a demo. OK, so who's done this at some point in their life? <laughs> Come on, like, admit to it. <laughs> I, think, I think there's a few people too embarrassed to put their hands up in here. Like, I, we're all in the same boat here. We're all bad people. Like, Obama's displeased with us. Um, so let's have a look at how we can, uh, man, I should have closed some things before we started the talk. Let's have a look at how we can improve on this. Oh, it's not switching. I think I have to. Stop presenting. Yeah. And now, nothing. No. No. It's like you run the command. 
I can Windows. All right, can everybody see that okay? All the way at the back? All right, great. So, uh, you know, let's, let's do our little curl command. <laughs> totally trustworthy. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, that's not, <laughs> not what I expected. Um, fortunately, this, this is my website. I keep a backup of it. Um, but before I run an update, let's actually initialize a tough repository, sign the correct copy into the tough repository, publish that, uh, verify that it now blocks the download of the bad data, and uh, then do our update and verify that we're getting the correct script. So uh, we have this notary CLI. Um, comes with many, many commands for key management, uh, dealing with change lists. Notary operates on a, a sort of change list concept where it stages changes before eventually publishing them. Um, and we have, uh, particularly, we're going to be looking at this command verify, which actually allows us to just pipe through small amounts of data or use files if we have larger amounts of data we're dealing with um, to make sure that something is good and as we expect. So we're going to initialize a repo and we're going to call it trustworthy.com because that's the website we're going to initialize it for. And this is going to ask me for some passwords. So Notary will attempt to reuse uh, a root key um, by default. Uh, you can also give the CLI uh, flags to tell it to use specific root keys. And then it's going to go and generate those targets and snapshot keys that we had in the slides. So it's going to ask me to enter the password twice for each of them, just to confirm. And note it didn't ask for a timestamping key. Uh, later? Make sure we have time to get through it. But also, uh, it's in one of the latest slides. We have a salon tomorrow, which is also going to be a great chance if you have time. So, um, so it didn't ask for a timestamping uh, key because it reached out to my notary server and requested a timestamping key for our trustworthy.com repo. And note all of these keys are ECDSA uh, with the P256 curve by default, if anybody's interested. Um, so I'm now going to uh, add to this repo uh, my awesome script. Uh, and this is the name that I wanted to have of the target within the repository. And then I'm going to give it the copy from my backup to make sure that I'm getting the correct copy of it. So this has been staged for publishing. Let's publish this. Publish. Publish. Okay, it's going to ask me for my targets key so I can actually sign in that new package or that new script into my uh, list of targets that I want to be available. Uh, and then it's going to ask me for the snapshotting key so I can update the inventory. Note that the notary server and signer also support rotating the snapshotting key to the server, which is really useful in the case that you have lots of delegations that you're having to manage. All right, so this says it's been published. Let's, uh, let's list it and just make sure that it's in there. All right, perfect. Let's run that verify command. And can you tell I was uh, testing this out earlier? Um, so fantastic. Tells me that the data I'm trying to download does not match the data in my trusted collection. Uh, so let's restore from my backup. Uh, and then just run this again. So it printed the script, obviously. We can actually pipe the end of this to Bash, and it will execute. Bash gives a really unpleasant error message in the case of notary denying the script. So, um, But we can pipe it to Bash, and it runs my script, and it's done a verification. It's made sure that the data we downloaded matched from the trustworthy.com repository the awesome.sh target that we were trying to download. Now you can extend this out. Um, there is an integration called Docker Content Trust built into the Docker CLI that does, um, uses Notary for signing Docker images. Uh, that can be used against any Docker registry. Uh, if you happen to be a Docker Enterprise customer, uh, that comes with instances of the Notary server and signer that you can already operate against, um, and also comes with policy management. So you can actually use these signatures to gate deployments going out to production. Useful features for high security environments. All right. So 
wrapping up, and I think we will have a minute for questions, so. So, um, as I mentioned, Notary is, um, is an open source library. It's part of the CNCF. And uh, if you all thought that this looks really cool, uh, we invite you to come contribute. There are a bunch of things that uh, we're looking into for the future of Notary, and it would be great to see you all tomorrow at 11, 10 a.m. in meeting room 4A, that is? Okay. Yep. Um, so yeah, thank you. It, I'm not sure how much time do we have for questions? About four minutes. Four, okay, cool. There we go. So. Um, so we support other algorithms if you bring your own keys. Um, but really, when I say other algorithms, RSA. Um, but it's, we actually, I'll like pat myself on the back. I feel like we did a reasonably good job of like abstracting the ciphers we support from the rest of the code base. Um, so it's, if anybody wants to add additional ciphers, it is relatively straightforward. Um, and I think the certain bits of the command line, like the key generation commands definitely let you configure like which cipher to use. Um, and then you can use those to then like uh, tell it to use specific keys for specific things. Um, we, had, we started off with uh, EC, DSA, and RSA with like RSA as the default, and it's just so slow. And every time you download, you're doing at least like four signature verifications, which takes meaningful time when you're using RSA keys. And, yeah. Um, so you mentioned the, like the Python package. Is it like a curated set of the appliance to say, okay, we have installed these Python packages. This will be automatically, you know, is there a way to say easily publish those curated sets? Um, you could do that through setting up your own signing. Um, so actually, there's a really interesting, uh, you should come to the salon tomorrow. Uh, the update framework has an update mechanism called um, tough enhancement proposals. Or, no, tough augmentation proposals, TAPS. Um, there is a proposal, I don't think it's been merged yet, for having multi-repository trust. So you could actually have PyPI as like the official source of packages, and then have your own trusted subset, so that like nobody can insert a package into your subset that isn't also in PyPI. Oh, okay. And then you can get that sort of like bi-directional trust. Um, so yeah, it's not in Notary, being debated I think still in uh, Tough. Um, it's been accepted. Ah, it's been accepted. Yeah. So. Still, something's happening merged with Limelight, but it's accepted. Yeah. I think this gentleman had his hand up next. So when you're signing a container or sorry, how does that work since the image isn't like <coughs> So, uh, the architecture slide, maybe I should skip to that. Uh, oh, I don't know that helps specifically okay. with this. Um, so, uh, fortunately, um, Docker images at least, which I believe still conform to the OCI spec and are intended to, um, are actually a Merkle tree. Hmm. So, every, the, 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 the manifest, or the multi-arch manifest now, sometimes called the manifest list, um, contains checksums of the layers um, the layers are tar files that you go and download. So it's, it, we sign in whatever the top level item is, whether it's a multi-arch manifest or a single architecture manifest. And from there, you have checksums of everything else that you need to go and download. Specifically, the metadata that, it, that is attached is like, contains everything that you need to uh, make the signing work. Any more questions? All right. There's what, like one minute left if anybody has any more questions. Otherwise, uh, salon tomorrow, yeah. 11, 10, 4A. Great chance to get more information. Justin will be there. We'll be there. So yeah, hope to see you tomorrow.